Live from WRAL News Headquarters in Raleigh, your number one source for local news. WRAL News, coverage you can count on. Breaking news, a man has been charged with murder and the shooting death of a Johnston County woman. We'll have all the details from the Live Center. And we have a freeze warning in effect tonight for a couple of our counties. I'll show you how cold it will be when you head out the door tomorrow morning. And prominent civil rights attorney Ben Crump is in Raleigh to announce a wrongful death lawsuit with, for the family of Daryl Williams. Why his involvement could make this a high profile case. A little bit chillier today. That colder air is moving into our area. Good afternoon to you. I'm Jeff Hogan. And I'm Renee Chu. Thanks so much for joining us. A freeze warning is in effect tonight for some of our counties on the eve of the first day of spring. Wouldn't you know it? Meteorologist Elizabeth Gardner is in the WRL Severe Weather Center with a look at who's affected and how cold it will be tonight where you are. We had a cold front move through overnight last night, and that has opened the door to some chilly air, allowing it to move into our viewing area. There's also going to be a disturbance that swings through a little later on. You can see a little bit of rain showing up here back to the west. So all this is evaporating before it reaches the ground. So not expecting to see any rain today, but we are looking at winds coming out of the north northwest right now, and that is allowing our temperatures to drop considerably compared to what we saw yesterday. 50 in Roxboro, 53 in South Hill. We did climb to 60 in Fayetteville and Clinton, but that cool air will continue to slide southward and eventually those temperatures will start to fall as well. Our freeze warning is for Lee County and Moore County, and we're not likely to see freezing temperatures east of here, but we are likely to see freezing temperatures near the Virginia line, and you may say, why is there not a freeze warning up to the north? The growing season hasn't begun here, and I'm going to go into detail about what that really means coming up in just a few minutes. But let's talk about some of those temperatures, and we're not looking, I'm not sure why it's showing up that cold. Well, we're not going to be in the 20s overnight tonight, but we are going to see temperatures in the low 30s across much of the region. Our wind speeds right now are about 3 to as much as 15 miles per hour, and of course that makes it feel really chilly. We'll see some gusts this afternoon, 18 to 19 miles per hour. Per hour and tomorrow morning it's possible that the wind chills will be down in the 20s in some places. We also have a small chance for some showers this, uh, this evening and I'll walk you through that on future casts coming up in just a few minutes. And breaking news right now in the WRA Live Center. We now know that a large law enforcement presence at a Johnston County home was due to a deadly shooting. We have video from the WRL breaking news tracker of that scene. Deputies were called to this home here in Johnston County on Bear Oak Drive uh, just before 930 last night. They arrived to find 44 year old Emily Steinhoff dead. Officials say Steinhoff had taken her sister to this home to pick up her baby. The baby had spent the weekend with his father, 50 year old Dorian Thomas. It was during the custody, it, the custody exchange that deputies say Thomas shot Steinhoff. Thomas is charged with murder. He's being held in the Johnston County Detention Center without bond this afternoon. Thanks for that. Breaking right now, police say a juvenile assaulted a woman on a greenway this morning. WRL's Destiny Patterson is live with what authorities say happened and where. Destiny. Well, Renee, right now I'm standing in the Brent, in the Bent Creek area in Raleigh. Right here is the entrance to the East Fork Mine Creek Trail. And police say that a woman was assaulted along a greenway right about 8.30 this morning. Now, I talked to a neighbor who lives in... He's lived here for about 20 years, and nothing like this has ever happened here. Wherever you go, there's always some kind of mixed up folk making life a little bit more difficult for other individuals out here. At this point, the suspect is described as a juvenile, so we won't know his identity, but radio traffic describes that that person as a teen between the ages of 16 and 18 and that woman was taken to the hospital with non-life threatening injuries. We're going to continue to stay out here and bring you updates as we get them. Renee. Destiny Patterson live in Raleigh. Thank you. Happening today, prominent civil rights attorney Ben Crump will be in Raleigh and he will announce the filing of a wrongful death lawsuit on behalf of the family of Daryl Williams. 
WRL's Ken Smith is here now with how Crump's involvement could make this a high-profile case, Ken. You know, Jeff, the term high-profile applies to attorney Brent Crump. His involvement in cases like the Daria Williams case tend to generate a lot of attention. Well, Crump is expected to talk in more detail about this lawsuit that names the city of Raleigh, the police chief, and the officers involved in Williams' death as defendants. Now, here's some background on this case. Williams was shocked with a police taser outside a Raleigh sweepstakes parlor last January. His cause of death is listed as sudden cardiac arrest. Now, on police body camera video, Williams can be heard telling officers he has a heart condition, but officers still used a taser to subdue him after Williams said that. Now, the autopsy also lists cocaine intoxication, physical exertion, and the use of a taser as factors in his death. Now, during a news conference later today at Mount Peace Baptist Church, Crump will be joined by attorney Joe Fausch, as well as attorney Dane, uh, Don Blagrove with Emancipation NC and the Williams family. Now, after that incident involving uh, Williams, six officers were put on administrative leave, but none of them faced charges. We will be at that news conference. Look for new reporting on this story in our early and late newscasts, as well as updates online and on the WRA News app. We'll do that. Thanks for the update, Ken. New at noon, James Dunmore, the man charged with killing Alicia Watts, is in court right now. This is video of Dunmore entering court in Montgomery County. Dunmore's attorneys are asking the judge to make his million-dollar bond unsecured, meaning he could be out of jail before his trial. This comes just days after Watts' autopsy was released, listing her cause of death as undetermined. WRL's Chelsea Donovan is inside the courtroom covering his appearance. She'll have updates on WRL.com and on our news starting at 4. Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson and the state's top Republican lawmakers are pressing the White House for answers after a man on the terrorist watch list was arrested here in North Carolina. WRL's Matt Tallhelm is live outside the Lieutenant Governor's mansion where he held a news conference within the last two hours. Matt, what came out of that? Yeah, Jeff. Well, Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson signed on to this letter. It is sent to President Biden at the White House here. Also signing on to this letter, House Speaker Tim Moore, Senate President Phil Berger and the Sheriff of Gates County. That's where this arrest happened. Now, the Lieutenant Governor held the press conference here, standing next to a photo of a wet hagos from that arrest in Gates County, which is in the eastern part of the state, right along the Virginia border. Hagos faces several charges, including resisting a public officer and assault on a government official. The sheriff's office says Hagos is from Africa and is on the federal terrorist watch list. The lieutenant governor used his office here to raise some questions about this case and to criticize the president's immigration policies. I asked Robinson why he's calling this an urgent threat now since uh, this arrest happened a week ago. At what point between then and now did this become an urgent public safety threat? And have you spoken to the governor or state law enforcement about this? Uh... It was urgent from the very beginning when it was brought to our radar. That's why we contacted the sheriff immediately to let to, uh, ask him uh, what we could do uh, to heighten folks' awareness and to let him know that we were there for his office to give him any assistance he needed. So it was urgent from the very beginning. And yes, we have sent this letter to the entire council of state. We have reached out to Governor Roy Cooper's office to find out what they know about this case and if they have talked to the lieutenant governor about this. Robinson, of course, is running for governor and immigration has become a big issue that Republicans are taking on in their campaigns. In fact, immigration was the most important issue for Republican North Carolina voters in a recent WRAL news poll. Robinson did waver a bit when he was asked whether he supports the bipartisan bill that was put into Congress. It failed under uh, uh, urging from President Donald Trump to reject that. So Republicans voted against that bipartisan immigration bill. Robinson here today said he wouldn't fully support it, but he wouldn't not fully support that immigration bill. All right, Matt Tallhelm, live outside the Lieutenant Governor's Mansion in Raleigh. Thank you. Today, enrollment for an after-school program begins for Durham Elementary School students. This year, the program will use a lottery system to fill open slots. WRO's Kelsey Coffey explains some parents are not happy about this new way to sign up. This is going to impact working parents the most. The staff here at the Durham Public Schools Central Services Building will be taking those applications starting today. 
And if parents sign their student up, their spot won't be guaranteed. The district says there are two factors at play here, staffing and higher demand. Right now, there are more than 1,600 slots in the elementary aftercare program, but there's 15 staff vacancies and nearly 300 students on the wait list. The lottery comes just weeks after classes were canceled for several days due to employee pay issues. This brings up a lot of concerns for parents, especially those who have multiple students, because there's a possibility that one student may be able to get in and their other children won't. That lottery application will close April 5th. Kelsey Coffey, WRL News in Durham. Tip-off times are out for the Triangle women's basketball teams playing in the NCAA tournament. UNC is an 8 seed, Duke is a 7 seed, and NC State a 3 seed. So NC State will host first and second round games right here at Reynolds Coliseum. They will host Chattanooga Saturday afternoon at 2.30. That will be shown on ESPNU. The winner of that game will play the winner of Tennessee and Green Bay. Duke will be in Columbus, Ohio for the first round matchup against Richmond. That game tips off at 2.30 on Friday. It'll be on ESPN News. And if Duke wins, they will likely play a home Ohio State team in the second round. And on Friday, the Tar Heel women will play Michigan State in the first round in Columbia, South Carolina at 11.30 in the morning. The game will be on ESPN2. If UNC gets a win, they will likely play undefeated South Carolina in the second round. Three Tobacco Road teams are getting ready for their first round matchups in the NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament. We have them lined up right here for you. North Carolina, one seed. The Tar Heels will play Thursday in Charlotte against the winner of the play-in game between Howard University and Wagner College. The Duke Blue Devils are a four seed in the South region. Duke will play Friday night in Brooklyn against Vermont. And coming off that improbable and historic ACC Tournament Championship, NC State scored an 11 seed in the tournament. The Wolfpack will play Thursday night against Texas Tech in the first round, and that game is in Pittsburgh. The WRL Interactive NCAA Bracket has a breakdown of every team and every game in March Madness. You can check it out before you make your picks. Just search Bracket on WRL.com. Next at noon, a deadly weekend for spring breakers in Florida. The number of arrests in Miami Beach, even with curfews in place. Also, the Supreme Court is now involved on whether the Biden administration violated the First Amendment. The case they will hear on free speech. Plus, Dollar General is throwing in the towel on self-checkout. The new rules designed to limit shoplifting. Keep watching WRAL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1257. Miami police arrested hundreds of spring breakers despite implementing a curfew over the weekend. Dana Marie McNichol has the latest. Miami Beach has been cracking down on spring breakers, including a curfew that begins at midnight until 6 a.m. from Friday through today. Despite this curfew, the Miami Beach Police Department says they arrested more than 250 partygoers over the weekend. But this still a drop from last year's mayhem that resulted in 500 arrests, the seizures of 105 guns, and two fatal shootings. Spring breakers in Miami say the rules are creating a different vibe compared to last year. I don't like the curfew. It sucks. Just cop cars lined up on every street. So it's been, I think it's better than all the other years. The Miami Beach mayor calling the new regulations a win-win. This is the calmest spring break we've had in, in, in years. We took some of the most robust measures we've, we've ever taken uh, by a long shot. This is actually a huge success for us this year. Meanwhile, one person is dead and two others are hurt after a shooting in Jacksonville Beach, Florida, Sunday night. Police are still looking for suspects. They say open fire on spring breakers in the city's downtown bar area. That district having to be placed on lockdown as officers scoured the area for what police believe to be multiple shooters. Two surviving victims are now in stable condition. We are safe um, with all the population influx we got every weekend. Um, this is a one-off, but it's going to happen. It's a game in numbers. As Dana Marie McNichol reporting, and that curfew in Miami Beach is expected to be lifted today, but officials expect those crowds to continue through the weekend. A bank card belonging to a missing University of Missouri student, Riley Strain, has been located near a river in Tennessee. 
A woman found the card near the Cumberland River in Nashville Sunday. Police say the woman, part of a search team there in String, was visiting Nashville on a string, spring break trip when he disappeared after being kicked out of a bar. Strain is a business senior at Mizzou, and he hasn't been seen since March 8th. A firewall appears to be working to stop raging lava flow in Iceland. The, count, the town of Grindavik built up the defenses to stop the hot molten rock. Scientists say the eruption appears to be weakening and could cease flowing soon. The volcanic system on Reykjanes Peninsula erupted for the fourth time in three months Saturday. Hundreds at a thermal spa attraction were forced to leave when eruptions began. Dozens of migrants are saved after their fiberglass boat capsized off the coast of North Africa. Video from the nighttime rescue shows crews from the Geo Barents rescue ship pulling migrants out of the water as people cried out for help. Those crews were able to rescue all 75 people from the migrant boat. Well, Cherry is making for lots of merry as some annual blossoms return early in Washington, D.C. This is a live look right there. Cherry blossoms bursting on the National Mall as an awaited rite of spring is underway. The National Mall Park Service posted a look at that beautiful petals there and its X account. The Park Service says now is peak bloom right now. Time is about 70 percent of the Yoshino cherry trees there that they're open. Warm winter temperatures helped bring them back a bit early. The show will last for several days. We felt some of those temperatures here recently. Elizabeth Gardner and the WRS Severe Weather Center. They're gone, though, now. They are. Temperatures are cool out there right now in the 50s. We'll see highs tomorrow in the 50s, too, for the first day of spring. And overnight tonight, it's going to be the coldest night that we've seen in a while. And we're not looking at any more temperatures in the 30s for the rest of the week. But it does stay chilly. This is a live look at Chapel Hill from Top of the Hill Restaurant. People out there, long sleeves, pants, jackets, that sort of thing. It is uh, it's definitely chilly, especially compared to yesterday when we saw temperatures in the low 70s. 56 degrees is our current temperature. We'll probably add a couple of degrees to it as we get closer to four or five o'clock, but it's not going to feel a lot different than it does right now. We do have some cloud cover out there and we'll see mostly cloudy skies for the rest of the day. Our dew point is 23. That just means we have a very dry air mass in place right now. So we are going to see some waves of moisture coming in and uh, some of that's definitely going to evaporate before it reaches the ground. Right now it's 50 in Roxboro, 60 in Fayetteville, Clinton and Goldsboro, 55 in Southern Pines, 59 in Rocky Mount. But we do have that colder air that's filtering in behind last night's front and it will continue to cool down our entire viewing area over the next 12 hours. 58 in Raleigh this afternoon, 57 in Durham and 62 in Fayetteville. We do have that freeze warning that's in effect for Lee and Moore counties overnight tonight where temperatures will likely be down in the low 30s. Now we are looking at some freezing temperatures in our northern counties, but there is no warning out for those counties. That's because the growing season hasn't begun there. The National Weather Service looks at uh, the historic times of the year when we tend to see uh, the first free or the last freeze, I should say. And then, of course, uh, the way the weather's been for the last month or so to determine when the growing season begins. So next Sunday, the growing season begins in our northern counties. But yesterday it began in our southern counties. And that's why it's uh, those two counties that are under the warning, even though that we're looking at uh, some cold freezing temperatures up to the north. It's a little bit confusing this time of year. By next week, no matter where we have freezing temperatures, everyone will be under that advice. 30 in Roxborough, 30 in Clarksville, 32 Lewisburg, 31 South Hill and Roanoke Rapids. And again, these are areas where uh, the Weather Service considers that there are not a lot of things growing that can be damaged by uh, the colder temperatures, whereas that's not the case here. So 31 Sanford Robbins, 33 Southern Pines. Uh, we could see some damage there. Temperatures east of that are in the mid 30s, most likely overnight tonight. 40s are normal low, so we are back to closer to normal temperatures Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. And then a little warmer than that on Saturday. We do have a small chance of a few sprinkles, a little bit of light rain uh, this evening from, say, 8 o'clock until midnight. Our pollen count is up. You probably noticed the yellow pine pollen is out everywhere. Now, the pine pollen is messy, but it's not an allergen, but oak definitely is. So I know there are a lot of people suffering with allergies right now. 58 for this afternoon, 34 in the Triangle tomorrow morning, and then just 57 for tomorrow. It's kind of funny. It is the first day of spring and the coldest day of the week. 70 for Wednesday, and then we settle down to very normal temperatures. But we do see some rain that rolls in potentially late Friday into Saturday. I'll walk you through the latest timeline coming up. Elizabeth, thanks. Nearly eight years after Hurricane Matthew caused catastrophic damage in North Carolina, a family is finally being moved into their new home. 
Hear more about the effort to rebuild in Sampson County after Hurricanes Matthew and Florence at 530. Then at 6, a Wake County Sheriff Sergeant spent 20 years helping others. It was finally time for someone to help him. How five on your side got him and his family some financial help. Still ahead this noon, changes are coming to show you how to shop at Target, specifically how to check out. We will break down some new restrictions coming up. Also coming up, the Biden administration's legal battle over social media content reaches the Supreme Court today. What this could mean for free speech in the digital age. Next. The Supreme Court is expected to hear arguments today on whether the Biden administration violated the First Amendment by pressuring social media companies to remove certain content. This case stems from the Biden administration calling for some misinformation about COVID-19 and the 2020 election to be removed from sites, which could have an impact on free speech protection. The Biden administration says limiting talks between government officials and social media owners could hurt its ability to address security risks and other public concern issues. Dollar General is backing away from the self-checkout trend in retail. The company is pulling out self-checkout stands in 300 stores that see the highest numbers of shoplifting and merchandise losses. In 9,000 other stores, Dollar General is converting some or all of its self-checkout registers to regular checkout with cashiers. And the company is limiting self-checkout to purchases of five items or fewer in more than 4,000 other stores. Same deal at Target, Renee. The days of being stuck behind someone with a cart full of items in the self-checkout line at Target are over. Retail giant announced customers will be limited to no more than 10 items if they go through the self-checkout. The change to express self-checkout goes into effect on Sunday at most of the chain's 2,000 stores nationwide. Target also says it plans on opening more traditional lanes that are staffed by employees. Another streaming platform is cracking down on password sharing. Hulu now joins Netflix in a new policy keeping people who don't live in the same household from using the same account. The company sent an email out in January warning users the new policy would begin in March. Disney Plus is also planning to introduce a new password sharing policy this summer, and Max says it'll roll out a new plan next year. Filing your taxes can be confusing. Tomorrow, you can get free help from tax pros on call. Five Under Side has partnered with the North Carolina Society of Enrolled Agents for a call-in event on Tuesday. Federally licensed tax professionals are volunteering their time to take your calls and answer your questions. Call in tomorrow from 4 to 7 p.m. Tune in to WRL for reports on tax changes, scams, and other resources available in our community. Breaking news, the man charged with killing Alicia Watts will remain in jail under the same bond. James Dunmore's attorneys were calling for his release. WRL's Chelsea Donovan will join us live outside the courtroom with new developments. And before that, as we head to break, here are your winning lottery numbers from the NC Education Lottery on your screen. Now, breaking news from WRAL. Coverage you can count on. Breaking now at 1230, the man charged with killing Alicia Watts will remain in jail under the same bond. James Dunmore's attorneys were calling for his release. WRO's Chelsea Donovan just stepped out of the courtroom after his hearing. And Chelsea, the DA says he saw the autopsy report on WRL before receiving it himself. So Assistant District Attorney Arthur Donato here in Montgomery County said in open court today that he only learned that Alicia Watts's cause of death was undetermined after he sat down for lunch on March the 12th, turned on his computer, opened up our website, WREL.com, and there he saw that. He said it's unfortunate that the media got a copy of her autopsy and the state has not, but he noted that Alicia was found dead in August uh, in a soggy pond bottom, but her autopsy wasn't finished or brought to his attention until last week. And of course, now that he knows that, he needs some time to sit down and question the medical examiner. This is a case, though, where the state says the lack of evidence has sort of been the norm. You'll recall last month, a judge ordered that any evidence from the state needed to be handed over to James Dunmore's attorney within 45 days. Now, let's show you the 
this new video uh, this morning of James Dunmore entering a Montgomery County court. His attorney, Laura Baker, said after that autopsy was made public, she filed a motion to release James Dunmore because Alicia Watts's manner of death was found to be undetermined. Uh, his attorney felt that he should be released immediately from jail since the state does not have enough evidence to keep him locked up. However, the state brought back this motion and noted that James Dunmore allegedly left Alicia Watts in a soggy pond bottom where it was discovered months later. Uh, the state also noted that to the judge that James Dunmore has a history of domestic violence, charges and convictions. And those are the reason that right now he should remain behind bars. So in the end, Judge Taylor Brown uh, left James Dunmore's bond at a million dollars secured. He'll be back here in court next month. And coming up in our later newscasts, you'll hear from all of Alicia Alicia Watts's friends and family and community members that came to this courthouse today to show their support. Yeah, a lot of new information coming out of this case. Chelsea Donovan live in Montgomery County for us. Thank you. And breaking news right now in the WRL Live Center, UNC head football coach Mac Brown has addressed the three UNC football players charged in a deadly crash that happened back in January. They are still practicing with the team as the legal process plays out. Uh, he announced that in a press conference earlier today. He says they've stayed out of it. He says they are letting the legal process take its course. Take a listen. Uh, but they will be involved in spring practice, and we're disappointed any time any of our guys uh, get mentioned in, in something that, that is uh, uh, against the law with a misdemeanor. Uh, but we've had the best record in the country of anybody, and I'm, I'm really, really proud of those guys and, and uh, disappointed in, in the three that are, are being questioned, but uh, that'll work itself out. Zachary Rice faces charges in connection with the January 21st crash that killed fellow student Molly Rotunda. Two other UNC football players are also charged, Travis Shaw and Malachi Hamrick. Uh, charges include possession of alcohol, exceeding a speed limit, and also underage possession of alcohol. We'll have more on the story coming up today at 4. All right, Michelle, thanks for that update. A global company is opening its doors to public school students in Durham. It's part of an inside look at the tech world for young minds. Mm. More than a dozen middle schoolers are the, at the Google offices in downtown Durham learning coding from the ground up. WRL's Monica Casey is there with them. Monica, what a cool collaboration. I'm sure this will be a day those students will never forget. Yeah, Renee, it's been really exciting. Those students are upstairs on the seventh floor of this building having lunch right now, but you can see all the work they have been doing here this morning. They've been working with Google employee volunteers on the computers you see here. The students tell me they have taken some computer science classes at school, and this is their chance to put those skills to use. Durham Mayor Leonardo Williams was also here today encouraging these students. He tells me this event shows how Durham can leverage the company Companies that are here connecting young people to some of the best jobs available. There are folks that are coming from all over the world to work right here in Durham. We want to make sure that our youth have that same opportunity and if we can prepare them without having to travel across the world, it's even better for us. Google employees tell me students today are learning the basics, opening up their computers and circuitry and working with volunteers to build those computers from scratch. The students here today tell me they are excited to learn about all of the opportunities a company like Google can offer and to take their experience outside of a traditional classroom setting. Renee? So exciting for those students. Monica Casey, live in Durham. Thank you. Tonight, Durham city leaders will consider asking for $5 million to begin cleaning up lead-contaminated soil at several parks in the city. Mayor Williams says the topic will be a significant focus during their budget meeting. People who live there believe the $5 million request is a good start, but only a start. The city has also requested the Durham County Department of Public Health provide additional blood lead testing, which the department ended in October of last year. City leaders will meet tonight at 7. Russian President Vladimir Putin mentions his former political rival for the first time since his death. Putin says he was a supporter of a potential prisoner swap of opposition leader Alexei Navalny just days before Navalny died in a Russian prison last month. 
Navalny's allies say Russia was in the final phase of negotiations with Western officials for a prisoner swap. Putin is also extending his presidency in Russia after winning by a landslide in Sunday's election. North Korea fired missiles into the sea today as U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited South Korea. Blinken went to Seoul for a conference on advancing democracy. South Korea's military says several short-range missiles were fired. The State Department condemned the missile launches and called on North Korea to engage in diplomacy and dialogue. The missile launches come days after South Korea and the U.S. wrapped up large-scale joint military drills. The career field that's in demand for this decade is STEM. Why it's critical to get students hooked on STEM as early as elementary school. And you may want to drink more kombucha or eat more kimchi. How fermented foods can boost your health. Our team is working to bring you exclusive stories. For coverage you'll find only on WRAL, visit WRAL.com and search only. We have cloudy skies out there, and with that and the cold front moving through, our temperatures only in the 50s for this afternoon. As you look live at Durham, you're watching WRL News, available on YouTube TV and the WRL app on your TV or streaming device. Marriages in the U.S. are back to pre-pandemic levels. The CDC says about 2.1 million couples got hitched in 2022. The COVID-19 pandemic canceled many weddings when health safety issues forced bans on large gatherings. In 2020, the number of I do's reached about 1.7 million. That's the lowest figure since 1963. Overall, marriages are not as common as they used to be. Kimchi, yogurt, and sauerkraut, just some of the fermented foods that research has shown could help boost your health. Not just your physical health, mental health as well. Dr. Susan Albers says while fermented foods could help improve your mood, ultra-processed foods have been found to do the opposite and can actually increase a person's risk for depression. Examples of ultra-processed foods include cereal, ice cream, and chips. Dr. Albers says, based on the known health benefits, it's worth trying to incorporate more fermented foods into your diet. Eating fermented foods is a powerful tool for nurturing your mental health by changing your microbiome. It releases a beneficial bacteria into our gut that makes a good environment for creating neurotransmitters that help to boost our mood. But fermented foods may not be safe for everyone, like those with a histamine intolerance or certain digestive disorders. If you have any concerns, it's best to consult, consult with your doctor. Celine Dion is updating fans about her current health condition. The singer revealed her battle with stiff person syndrome in 2022. It's a rare neurological condition that triggers spasms and muscle rigidity. Last Friday, Dion said battling the condition has, quote, been one of the hardest experiences of my life. However, she hopes to grace the stage again one day and live a normal life. Coming up, explaining the new push to get kids excited about STEM careers and why academic experts say it's critical parents get kids hooked at an early age. And later, we'll explain why a 750-pound pet named Albert was taken from his home in New York. right now in the WRA Life Center. Wilson County is getting 400 new jobs. Biopharma manufacturer Shot Pharma USA uh, says they plan to create 401 jobs in Wilson County. Shot would build a new facility in Wilson to make syringes for pharmaceutical and biotech companies. They said they're looking to employ as we wrap things up, here's a look at a few of the headlines we're following today. A juvenile is in custody after a woman was assaulted on a Raleigh Greenway. It happened around 8.30 this morning in the area of Long Street Drive and Bent Creek Drive. The woman was taken to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. The male juvenile was taken into custody a short distance away. A man is facing murder charges after police say he shot and killed a woman during a custody exchange. This happened on Bear Oak Drive in Smithfield last night. Police say Emily Steinhoff had taken her sister to pick up her baby from Dorian Thomas, the baby's father. And that's when Thomas shot Steinhoff. Thomas is in the Johnston County Jail without bond. 
biopharma company plans to bring more than 400 jobs to Wilson County. Schott Pharma will invest $317 million into a new manufacturing facility to produce syringes. Construction begins by the end of this year with operations beginning in 2027. The announcement came today during a meeting of the State Department of Commerce's Economic Investment Committee. It's another big weekend at the box office for Kung Fu Panda 4. The animated adventure took the top spot for the second weekend in a row, bringing in $30 million. It beat out Dune Part 2, which held steady at number two, having earned just a little over $29 million this weekend. Mark Wahlberg's new movie, Arthur the King, debuted at third place, $7.5 million. Authorities seized a 750-pound pet alligator from a New York home. The gator, named Albert, is believed to be about 30 years old. The pet was taken away after the owner was unable to renew his license to keep Albert. The massive reptile is now receiving treatment from a licensed caretaker. A senior dog in Texas has waited years to find his forever home, and his wish has finally come true. A 10-year-old Velcro has special needs, including being partially blind and deaf, and has mobility issues. He had spent over 700 days at a shelter, but then in February, 74-year-old Jeanette walked in and felt the dog was meant for her. So Jeanette encourages others to not overlook special needs and senior dogs because they deserve love as well. Aww, seeing the two of them together, Cute. that's so sweet. I love it. Durham Public <laughs> School students are getting a behind-the-scenes look at what it's like to work for Google. WRL's Monica Casey takes us inside their hands-on day of STEM learning coming up on WRL News today at 4. NBC News Daily is next on WREL, your next local news update in 30 minutes. You can always get breaking news updates anytime with our WREL News app. A little bit of sunshine out there, yeah. but it's kind of chilly. Have a great day. Keep watching WREL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1257.